I didn't tell you any of the data to support this, but I want to give you this as a something to think about. This is not a model. This is a fact that the way the nervous system is wired up to muscle is much more complicated at birth than it is two weeks later. And that is you have something that's akin to an all-to-all -all connectivity where each neuron diverges to make synapses on many, if not all, the muscle fibers. And each muscle fiber receives convergent input from many axons. And you go two weeks later, and then you have this hyper simple wiring diagram. And I, you just have to take my word for it, because I, I didn't show you the data to support this. But this is the way it is. I've spent 30 years studying this phenomenon. And this is the adult pattern. And it stays this way without change until an animal is very old. It means that when the wiring diagram is young in a mammal, there are all sorts of possibilities. And then through the magic of development, choices are made, and a very small subset of what initially was made as synapses end up in the adult nervous system. And I just want you to think about that, because this may also be true, not just in muscle. I know it's also true in neurons in the peripheral nervous system. And it probably is true in a number of parts of the central nervous system as well, that the ultimate wiring diagram is not so much related to canonical circuits but in some kind of choice about which connections are maintained and which ones are eliminated. And that allows what is difficult for a child to do, like to tell the difference between a P and a Q, becomes automatic in an adult. Because there's no longer any real computation going on. You're now wired, if you will, for a particular perception or a particular motor output. Whereas a child has trouble walking, an adult does it without thinking. And that's maybe because you're going from a hyper complex nervous system that doesn't know what it's designed to do through experience becomes a simpler one. That is a biological model based on uh, bottom-up analysis of the way wires change in the periphery. I just bring that up because I want you to understand that for me at least, there is a way of thinking about models where you start with biology and then uh, b generate a model, and then you say, well, what would the equivalent of this be in the cortex, for example? Yes. yes. Uh, do you think it's experience? You, know, you mentioned it's experience that prunes it. It is experience. In this case, it is experience. It, it, as you can show, it's experience by blocking activity or by stimulating axons. Okay. To, to what extent is the selected subset the same in all individuals? Uh, I was going to show that when we did this wiring diagram, left and right side of the same animal, or this left muscle of animal after animal, every single one is unique. Every single animal? Every single instantiation. Even the left and right mirror symmetrical muscles have different wiring diagrams. And the sets are disjoint, like in the picture? What? The sets are disjoint, like in the picture, like the red neuron? Mm -hmm. um, I'll just show you. This is, this is the real McCoy. The nerve and each color is a different axon. So they're just distributed. And that pattern is different in every animal. Uh, yeah, but every neural, uh, motor neuron is connected to uh, a different set for every motor neuron. Like one yes, motor neuron. that's right. It's one to one in the end. At the beginning, it's many to one and one to many. At the end, it's one axon goes to many, but it's the only axon left. <coughs> Sorry, and all this happened in the billions of years of evolution? It's happened to mammals. Yeah. It but doesn't happen in fish. Would it be easier to attribute it to divine intervention? Yes, it would be. <laughs> <laughs> it would be. It would be. But that doesn't, it doesn't help <laughs> to blame God. <laughs> She may have big ideas, but I'm not sure uh, that's going to help us make sense of this, if there anything. There is a basic reason for this. There aren't enough genes to encode all the connections. One possibility is there aren't enough genes. Another possibility is that a brilliant idea happened at some point in evolution, that you could make an animal fit, not by its genes per se, but by allowing its wiring diagram 
to be modified by the experience of that particular animal. What's yeah. So that, that's what I think is the big key here. Because it, what, what's happened in mammals is instead of having an identified neuron do something, as you find in insects or in worms, you have a whole bunch of neurons doing all the same thing. Why, why do that? It's because you can then parse this out and make a very complicated set of individual wiring diagrams that you wouldn't be able to do with genetics. Yeah. I think it might be misleading to call this a wiring diagram, yeah. given that if you scrambled all of the colors randomly, you would have an equally good wiring diagram. You know, you gave the example of left and right was, were all randomly scrambled yeah. versions. Yeah. Every animal is different. I, I, so it doesn't matter is another explanation for yeah. It's, it's true, except I understated what's actually here. There's something called the size principle where you recruit axons in a fixed order from the uh, largest, no, sorry, from the smallest to the largest. These are not all the same. There's a biggest one, there's a second to biggest one, and on every bustle, they're not a Gaussian distribution. There's a stepwise distribution of sizes. And so there is something being worked out here. And the ones that are small are causing minor movements in the muscle, and the ones that are bigger are only used when you have a catastrophic requirement to, in this case, pull the ear all the way back very quickly. And that is maintained, but the exact positions and wires are in different places, because the position doesn't matter. Anyway, I wanted to get through that very quickly, and I failed. So. OK. So that's what we did with light microscopy. But unfortunately, at early developmental stages and in the central nervous system at any stage, uh, fluorescence techniques like brain bow don't have sufficient resolving power to see each connection of each axon. If you label one axon, you can see it's wiring. But, if you want to, but you can't see the targets. If you want to see all the targets and you want to see all the axons, you can't use fluorescence. So we went to an electron microscopy approach with much, much, much better resolution uh, to allow us to look at volumes of tissue. And so we have an automatic pipeline. And uh, you can start with something like a window into the mind of a rodent, um, where you look at the activity patterns with dyes that change the intensity of the light coming back from individual cells, fluorescence. Uh, while the animal is doing something, like looking at the world. So this could be a window into the visual system. Then you cut out uh, a piece of this brain. You perfuse it to get rid of the blood. And then you go through a uh, complicated staining procedure to put heavy metals into every single membrane. Uh, and then we often take an x-ray to provide us with a low-resolution micro-CT image that shows us the location of every neuron. And that is useful because it allows us to make sure uh, that we can align the light microscope, microscope activity to the electron microscopy. We then cut this up using a machine that I'll explain in a second, an automatic tape collecting ultramicrotome, and put this brain on tape. I'll show you how that's done. The tape is then put on a very special holder. And that holder allows us to map the position of every piece of brain section, which is all along here. I'll explain that as well. And then uh, we map all those positions and then send that information into an electron microscope, uh, a multi-beam scanning electron microscope, the fastest electron microscope I think ever built. Uh, and I'll explain what that is as well, to allow us to automatically take images of each of these sections. We then stitch and align them. This is computationally an intensive process because the data sets are so large. And then ultimately, the data is segmented and rendered. And uh, Nir Shavit is going to talk about uh, these very interesting technologies that he uh, is developing uh, to do segmentation. But I I'm going to talk about all the pipeline up to there and give you some sense of the kinds of things you get out of this. And we've already done this uh, with a laboratory of a fish expert, Florian Engert, uh, to do the myelinated pathways in a larval zebrafish. Um, we've worked on human brain organoids uh, with uh, the lab of pa Paola Arlotta. Um, and I'm just giving these as examples here. Dennis Stacy, Rachel Wong, and John Dowling. We've worked on a human fovea uh, 
and with uh, Aravi Samuel Lab and your own here and near Shavit uh, and Mei Zhen in Toronto, uh, we are uh, participating in the reconstruction of the wiring diagrams of many different larval stages of this worm that has a, such a small number of nerve cells. We're working on the cerebellum. These are all examples. But I'm not going to talk about any of those uh, today. You may hear a little bit about the worm this afternoon, I hope, and maybe some about a muscle project that we're also involved in um, from near. So the key technology for this is to take a three-dimensional piece of brain and uh, flatten it out into a series of sections. And we do this using an automatic tape-collecting ultramicrotome, a little thing Ken Hayworth and Richard Schleck uh, built uh, in the lab as a means of giving us a permanent picture, a way of getting pictures of every little part of the brain. So you take a three-dimensional brain and turn it basically into a film strip. And the way this is done is that the brain is being sliced by a diamond knife, and the slices are coming off in water. Uh, I'll show you a little movie of this place right here. So here's a diamond knife. There's water in this boat here. Uh, the brain is being sliced uh, against this diamond knife. It comes up in the water, and then you can see these sections one after another being picked up by this tape. So that's the approach. Um, and then uh, each of these sections is about 30 nanometers, so about 1,000 of them make up the thickness of a hair, and we can cut up to 10,000 sections a day. And these sections are, you know, a couple, th this section is maybe uh, a millimeter wide and two millimeters long. Well, we can do three by two millimeter sections, no problem. And then uh, here, Bobby Kasturi, who uh, is now at Argonne and University of Chicago, uh, is holding one of these wafers where we've cut a strip of these um, tape uh, to show you what they look like once they're stained with heavy metals. And so he's moving into the electron microscope now. This is the cerebral cortex. That's the uh, hippocampus. These big white things are nerve cells. This is a blood vessel. These white stripes you're seeing here are the apical dendrites of, of those pyramidal cells. These black outlined objects are myelinated axons that are unsheathed. And then as we zoom up further and further, finally we get to a resolution where you can see one of these cross sections filled with vesicles up against a dendritic spine. So this is a dendrite. There's its spine neck. There's that spine apparatus. Here's an axon filled with synaptic vesicles, and that's the synapse between the two. So that's good. You can take these tape and get images like this. We use a scanning electron microscope to do this. Um, that's the good news. The bad news is that this image is right there. About there. This is a millimeter by a little bit more than a millimeter by a millimeter, 1.2 by 1.2 millimeters. I remember um, that whole object, when we began, we had to take a bunch of images. Each of these little boxes is a separate image we took on the electron microscope of this one section, 30 sections. Uh, and we were going pretty fast, um, 5 million pixels per second. That's five times faster than most confocals take pictures. To get 30 tiles, that took five hours. So five hours gives you this whole image of one section, which, by the way, is only this big. So it's not much. If you wanted to do not just that one section, but do that many sections in depth, so not only a millimeter by a millimeter, but a millimeter by a millimeter by a millimeter, you would have to do that if you're doing 30 nanometers, 33,333 times. So you got to multiply five hours by 33,333. 17 years. So nobody, I've not been able to find any graduate students interested in this project <laughs> wants to do this because that's just insanely long. So somehow we have to go faster. We have to image the brain a lot faster. And for us, the solution uh, is uh, this machine, uh, which I'm up against. I, which allows us to do the whole thing in six months instead of 17 years. It's not a completely happy smile, I would say. <laughs> and there are many reasons for this. Uh, the most obvious one you can't see until I show you that I'm standing on a chair with wheels. 
And I'm just desperately holding on for dear life up here. This looks like a refrigerator, but it's, it's like a refrigerator for giants. You know, I'm not very tall, but still, I'm standing on a chair, and I'm just barely reaching the top of it. It's about 10 feet. It's just insanely tall. It's also insanely expensive. And uh, it was built for us uh, by this company, and it's called the Multisem 505. And that 505 was there simply to give me the confidence that they knew what they were doing. This is really the Multisem point zero one. It's very, <laughs> so there's a lot of issues here. But they, they, they're really magnificent engineers, and they built an amazing machine. It, it is um, generating about 11 terabytes a day, and it's probably the fastest electron microscope ever built. And I'll explain how it works in a second. So you can take off that beautiful cover uh, and then see the underlying engineering. It's a 61-beam scanning electron microscope. And, and the way it goes so fast is it parallelizes the scanning process. Remember, I, was, I showed you that image with the 30 images taken in sequence. This is a machine that has 61 beams in it that all work in parallel. So that gives us a lot more speed. It's a very amazing, uh, complex uh, diagram. And I won't go through too much of the details, other than to say there's an electron source that goes through something that looks a little bit like a shower head with a bunch of little holes in it. And it generates that electron beam into 61 separate beams that each illuminate a separate region of the specimen. And each one is scanned independently to make a little rectangular box. And then they generate uh, the electron's interaction with the data. Uh, the osmium generates secondary electrons, which are very low energy electrons, that come back out, are pulled up. And because they're so low energy, like a dichroic mirror in a fluorescence microscope, you can pull them out of this high energy beam, the low energy electrons come out here. And each of those positions end up in a separate place on a phosphor plate. And the phosphor plate, if you, which generates light, uh, shows 61 beams arranged in a hexagon. That's, and the one in the middle is what makes it 61 beams. Then there are 61 fiber optics that measure the intensity of the light now coming off of the phosphor screen and take that, uh, those fiber optics go to 61 avalanche photodiodes and then generate it back into electricity. Why you go through electricity to light and back to electricity is an engineering uh, design issue, but it works very nicely. And so you get images where each of these dots are scanning a small region, and you get all this at once. And this is what an image looks like now. So it's kind of weird, because it's sort of hexagonal. Uh, and we can generate 108 by 108 microns uh, in a much smaller amount of time. We call these MFOVs, uh, microscopic field of views, uh, with 61 images taken at once. And then to generate something like a <coughs> millimeter, uh, we automatically just uh, do this. We take each of these little green things as one of those 61 beam hexagons, and we tile this all automatically. And this is sped up, but this takes about five minutes to do instead of five hours, because we got 61 beams, so we're going 60 times faster. And then you carve out of uh, each of the sections the common area and uh, make a volume. And Maybe you get a sense here that although this is jumping around because of our targeting not being precise, the neurons aren't moving. That's these gray objects here. And that means that we have overcome the alignment problem for very large data sets. And I'm going to show you if this still is running. Let's see here. So this is the largest data set we've done to date. This has 508 MFOVs or about 36,000 tiles. Um, this is a project that we're uh, getting segmented through Google with Varen Jain uh, leading the charge there. And here uh, I'm hooked into their uh, neuroglancer at their headquarters or wherever this is. I don't know, I actually have no idea where this is. Um, and I'm just going to, this is online, so if in principle this works. Let's see here. So, so this is 61 holes, right? 61 beams. Why, why can't you scale it to, I don't know, 1,000 beams? You could. You could. could. I mean, each beam costs money. 
This only costs five million, so there's probably some economy of scale here. Maybe a better thing would be to have multiple machines like this, because then if one broke, the other ones would still be running. I'm acutely aware of this. That that, that would be, but yeah. Well, it's you know, it's new technology. Yeah. So, I'll just give you a sense of the scale. This is a 300 gigabyte image. So a terabyte for every three <coughs> sections. And, you know, it's, um, it would take me probably eight hours at this rate to get from one end of the section to the other. It just goes on forever like this. i give you a sense of just what big data looks like in image data here. Can you image the uh, So this is uh, two millim three millimeters by two millimeters. The yep, we do image the asterisks. I'll show you that in a second. Okay. So after that, you carve out uh, a data set, and I've shown you this zooming up just by going automatically. Um, if I go back here, one, oops, let just go back this one. Uh, this will give you a sense of why connectomics is so interesting. If we, if you look at the data now, now we're looking not just at one section, but we're playing that film strip going from section to section. It's been aligned by a multi-core cluster. These are nerve cells uh, and their nucleus that are coming out of you and new ones coming into view as we go into the data set. All this stuff moving around, of course, is not alive. It's, uh, it's moving around because we're moving through a three-dimensional volume. Uh, and all these little objects are axons and dendrites, and these are nerve cells and their nuclei. And this goes on for thousands of sections. Um, there's a blood vessel up there. I'm going to go to this resolution uh, just so you can see everything here. So this is what Connectomics raw data looks like. Uh, you have processes, you can follow them by eye very, very easily from section to section. Occasionally they turn into synapses. Here's a big cell uh, and its nucleus, nucleolus that are, is coming into view. Those are mitochondria, which are energy organelles. Endoplasmic reticulum is what this stuff is here. The cell is receding uh, and then we're back into neuropil again where wires are connected to other cells, and here's another uh, neuron appearing here. It's just uh, extraordinary uh, <laughs> that this is what brains are made of. I can look at this all day. I really can. I, I like to look, but I really love to look at this stuff because it's so interesting. And the challenge, of course, is to turn this into data, not just pictures. Uh, but this gives you a sense that these techniques for alignment work. And then when you're done, you end up with a data set you know, that could be a cube, a big cube of, of brain tissue. Uh, and here it's on its edge, so you can see all six faces. This is just 100 by 100 by 100 microns. So it's only two terabytes. It's only 3,333 sections. At this rate, a cubic millimeter would be two petabytes. Um, and then from that, you can reconstruct right in this volume uh, here is an inhibitory neuron. I will show you how we do this by hand, but now there are techniques that do this automatically, I hope, uh, that work very well. Eventually they will do all of this. This is a neuron, an inhibitory neuron with its blue axon and myelin, partially myelinated processes. Uh, here are two pyramidal neurons. 100 by 100 microns is so small, it's hard, you can't get a whole pyramidal cell in there. There's one there, there's the apical dendrite of another. Uh, and here's uh, some inhibitory axons innervating a pyramidal cell. And I won't talk about the details of this right now. I'll just give you a sense that this 100 by 100 by 100 micron uh, volume, which is a million cubic microns, uh, is two terabytes, and it has about 40 neurons and a million synapses. And what we are charged by one of our grants to do now is a cubic millimeter, which will be a billion cubic microns, be that big. Uh, it's two petabytes, uh, 40,000 neurons. Everything's at multiplied by 1,000. This is not very sophisticated what I'm doing here, and a billion synapses. So we've already cut a cubic millimeter. Uh, I'll show you what that looks like. That's a lot of tape. 
uh, we needed this much tape and we spliced it all together and laid it out end to end, kinda, uh, and uh, got a crowd uh, to look at how big it is. It's 115 yards. And it's impressive at Harvard how interested people are in connectomics. This happened also to be the Harvard-Yale game. And we weren't actually there. It's fake news. But that's how big, that's how much tape has all those sections. And here's all the, um, here's each of them. Uh, this is just a montage of 33,000 sections. Each section looks like that. Um, and I could play a movie, it's awfully boring, uh, of all 33,000 of them. Uh, I'm playing it at 60 frames a second so it can go fast, but it's still 15 minutes or so to get through the whole movie, so I'm not going to bore you with this. But you would see that most of the sections come off. They look pretty good. This is the pia, this is the white matter. So this is the cortical thickness of a rat. Um, there were 120 wafers we made. Each one had 270 sections. Uh, the sections were a little bigger than a millimeter by a millimeter. They were 30 nanometers in thickness. Uh, we only collected 986 microns because we miscounted the number of sections we had taken embarrassingly. But you, you count to 33,000 and see if you, you get it right. <laughs> so we, did, we had a lot to learn. This is our first try at this. So we actually uh, sectioned 1.73 cubic millimeters. And most of the sections, 98.3%, were satisfactory. Some had local defects. And 103 were destroyed by the sectioning. Uh, that number sounds 0.3%, not so bad. For us <coughs> to do a cubic millimeter, it means that if these are random, the probability of two adjacent failures is one out of 111,000. So it's not likely to ruin our ability to do reconstruction. So here is the cubic millimeter. This is at low resolution, not at full resolution. Uh, so we haven't done that yet. We're in the process of starting this right now. So what do you do? Um, Daniel Berger made a program that's just basically a digital coloring book uh, that allows us to take a stack of these images, find an object of interest, and color it in. This is painstaking work. Um, Automatic segmentation, as you'll hear, uh, makes this all go much faster. But this does give you a sense of what you get out of data like this. So you can generate a dendrite and its spines. And you can generate the axon that innervates those spines um, unambiguously. This is not just that they're near each other, but when you look in the EM, you actually see, as you'll see here, synaptic vesicles in the axon abutting the dendritic spine. So you know this, is, this works. And well, what have we done with this? So here is an example of a piece of cortex um, where we have rendered everything in this area. So everything is colored in. Uh, and there is these shapes appearing. Uh, this green shape, it's very hard to infer the three-dimensional shape of an object from individual sections. I don't know, does anybody have an intuition about what this shape is? Cylinder. cylinder, very good. Yeah, it's, for most people, it's very hard to see that this is a cylinder. But that's a cylinder around this apical dendrite. And this green cylinder is around this apical dendrite. They each have spines. And the purpose of this paper was to simply ask the question, within the spine diameters of these two dendrites, what else? is in that same area. So within the distance of the spines away from a neuron, is there anything else there? And obviously, there's a lot of other stuff there. But this, show, this will show you what is actually there. So here is the reconstruction of those two uh, dendrites. Uh, we did twice as much length of the red dendrite as the green one. They're covered with spines, more spines than we expected to see. Because we labeled everything, we couldn't miss any spines. There was nothing left unlabeled in there, so we got a high density of spines. Um, and this is the spine that sticks out the furthest. You'll see it stick its head out uh, a little bit later. So in addition to um, these two dendrites, there are lots of other dendrites that are pushed in to this area here. Here are all the dendrites in this volume. That's the red dendrite and the green dendrite. And all these other pieces are pieces of dendrites of other neurons that are within one spine diameter. That's the longest spine right there of, of this, these two cells. Of course, the dendrites are um, got to be 
innervated by something. So there have to be axons in there too, even though it doesn't look like there's much room left. There's actually eight times more axons in this volume than dendrites. Here are all the axons. It's kind of amazing that these fit together. Uh, so where there's a big hole here, you know, there's a dendrite. But there's a lot of axons squeezed in there, but I'm still forgetting a cell type. Somebody mentioned the astrocytes. Yeah, so there's also got to be astrocytes in there, and there's all the astrocyte processes, which also seem to take up most of the space. Uh, so that's everything. There are the little things sticking out right there. Uh, and then we made this movie just to show all those objects. I don't know. Depressing is one word that comes to mind when I look at this. <laughs> Is this is not a big area we're looking at here. There's an extraordinary number of things, and we're just within the dendritic spine distance of two dendrites that are right next to each other. Just amazing number of objects. And of course, uh, we like to look, so we identified every one of those objects. Um, and they could be divided uh, roughly into axons, glia, et cetera, and dendrites. And the axons could be divided into myelinated axons, inhibitory axons, and excitatory axons based on structural differences. Um, the dendrites, there were spiny ones and smooth dendrites. Those are the dendrites of inhibitory neurons. There were, in addition to astrocytes, oligodendrocyte processes that make the myelin that ensheath axons. And embarrassingly, there were a bunch of things that we don't know what they are. Many of them we traced out very long distances out of this little volume, and we still don't know what they are. They don't seem to make synapses or receive synapses. They just seem to be growing, <laughs> so we don't know what they are. A couple of these we now know are microglia, and I, I'll, I may have a chance. I'll show you Is a picture. Just one astrocyte? Uh, it's actually two astrocytes. They tile roughly like this but they interact, they're two astrocytes. And of course, they're not two whole astrocytes. They're just little pieces of two astrocytes. Each astrocyte would be more like this size. So that seems impressive until you realize that this is what we did. <laughs> These are those two neurons. We did all, nothing, basically nothing. But if I make it big, it looks better, but it is still Really, really, really small amount of work. Uh, uh, well, not small amount of work. It was five years, uh, 1,600 cubic microns. At that rate, uh, this is about three billionths of a mouse brain. You know, we can't. If you do this manually, it would take a trillion years to do a whole mouse brain. So you can't do it that way. But in there, there were 1,407 different axons. Uh, we know they're different based on the branching patterns of axons, and it's in this paper. If you're curious about how we counted that they were different and not the same axon branching, mostly excitatory axons. There were lots of dendrites in there. 193 different neurons were sending dendrites in there. Many fewer dendrites than axons for interesting reasons, we think. Uh, and 1,700 synapses in there. So about a synapse every cubic micron, meaning that in a cubic millimeter, uh, there will be about a billion synapses in cortex. Um, so what did we learn? I think there were a couple of things that were surprising. And one is that if you think of the dendritic spines, let's say of the red dendrite, there are so many red dendritic spines there. It's an interesting question how many other dendritic spines are within its territory exactly in that same area. And it turned out there were many more spines of other neurons in the same area. So in the following movie, all the spines that are not from the red dendrite are gray, and all the red dendritic dendrite spines are red. And you see that even right within the diameter of the dendritic spines of that red dendrite, most of the spines are coming from neurons that are just pushed in there as well. Uh, and, and that is interesting because that means that an axon running through here has no greater chance of hitting the red dendritic spines than any other spines. In fact, it has a lower probability. Nonetheless, when we looked at an axon that made a synapse on a red dendritic spine and traced it, they often, with much greater probability than one would expect by chance, innervated other spines on the red dendrite. So here is the red dendrite, and here's an, these are axons that are finding multiple spines of the red dendrite and not innervating the spines of the other cells. And this kind of selectivity is interesting because it implies 
that this is not just a random wiring diagram, but rather axons are selectively making lots of synapses on some target cells and not on others' target cells in the same exact uh, position. And if you make a lot of synapses, that's a very good way to have a powerful synapse. And a lot of theories about learning are related to synapses getting strong. A good way to make a strong synapse is to have the same axon innervate a lot of spines of the same target cell. And that turned out not to be uh, unusual, but common. In our data, we found, for example, even though this is a very short region, uh, a dendrite that had five different spines all contacted by the same axon. The chance of this axon just randomly finding five spines associated with this dendrite and not any of the other spines around it is infinitesimally small. So, yeah. Um, so you say that an axon contacts one particular dendrite and not many of the others that are around. Uh, is this a pruning effect, or uh, so might it sort of initially have contacted a lot of the others as well, and then it's gone? Because it has to somehow to notice whether it's one or right. uh, I, one or the other, right? I couldn't have said it better myself. This is the question we're after right now. If we do the same thing in babies and do a comparative connectomics, do we find that the convergence rate is different? What I didn't show in that work on muscle, I, sh I, I just flipped through the sides, I didn't show it, is that that massive pruning is what's going on there. You start out with weak connections from many neurons on each target cell, and then you end up with one very powerful connection, and the others are pruned away. Maybe that's the same learning paradigm going on in the Because brain. if it's a result of a learning process, I think initially it should actually make contact and try whether it's worth connecting to Exactly. That there should be lots, le lots more uh, interconnectivity, yeah. more convergence, but weaker connections. That's what we're wondering about. And then sort of the state of the art is that we can actually image every synaptic vesicle in every axon making a synapse on the red dendrite. And that is what's shown here. So these are only axons that are synapsing on this particular dendrite. And not only are the axons shown, but each of the vesicles uh, to see whether some have more neurotransmitter vesicles than others. And in fact, there is a wide range of synaptic vesicle densities. So this is sort of the state of the art of what one can do with serial EM. Um, but along, yes, go ahead. Um, is it possible that in order to image and analyze a human brain, you need essentially the computing power of a human brain? And there's some sort of like universal yeah. limit of like, you can't create the software or the hardware without understanding the brain, you can't understand the brain. Well, we've given up on understanding, honestly. Uh, I, I think we're, we're all into description. Okay. Um, but, uh, Is there like a hope for description either? Yeah, I think you okay. could describe it, and you could have perhaps machines that would understand it in the sense that they would, you could simulate sort of brain function in silico, perhaps. But I'm not sure you would understand it. And I'm not saying anything about you. I'm just saying fundamentally, humans' brains are only this big. Uh, and, and you have to take account here of thousands and thousands, maybe millions of things happening simultaneously. It's more like it, it, I say, is there ever a chance that a human being will understand New York City? You say, well, that's ridiculous. How can you understand it? There's so many things going on at the same time. This is even worse. <laughs> There's no, I think the word understanding is maybe the wrong word. Okay. Well, maybe not understanding, but is there, um, there seems to be a possibility of a gap that we will never cross because we would need computers that have the ability of the brain that we can't under or yes. not understand. I think our computers will understand this. I just don't think we will. Do you I think we have computing power that could analyze the data without yeah. a computer that has the abilities. Of I mean, it's sort of like if, if you had a computer algorithm that's predicting the stock market. It understands the stock market to do a better prediction than you can do, no matter how smart you are. You so, just, yeah. so you like computing power. Yeah, computing power. You just okay. put enough computers. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I think there's a possibility. I think it's a different kind of understanding than what biologists mm -hmm. like me want, which is I sort of tell you the answer, and you say, oh, I get it. I don't think you're going to get this. Well, not from me, because I can't get it. And, and that was, you know, what I wanted. I've got a f 20 more minutes, right? Okay.
<coughs> was there another? Yes, sir. So uh, when you map the uh, one cubic meter, uh, millimeter of gray, uh, yes. can we do it like at one time instant? Or because yeah, the this is a lethal experiment. <laughs> it's a one point in time experiment. You could get an, another animal at another age, but uh, you can't. You can't do this except by cutting it up, and that usually means killing the animal. <laughs> now we have human data that is not killed. Uh, that thing I showed you uh, with neuroglance or that big data is human data from a human that was not dead, but was it was removed from a patient who had epilepsy. But not, it wasn't the epileptic focus, but it was just to get in access. So there are places where you can get data. If that patient wanted, we guess could come back later and take out some more brain. <laughs> I doubt any human being would want that, though. So this is really a one-time thing. And that's its big weakness, as opposed to many of the dynamic techniques we have. But it does give you a, ma a measure of everything that's going on in the brain at that moment in time. And I think in adult brains, most of what we're doing is using our brains. But you know, we think that we're still learning a lot. You maybe at your age, but at my age, <laughs> I know, at least my children tell me I'm not learning anything because they don't want to hear anything from me because they say I've heard, we've heard it all before, Dad. <laughs> they don't ask questions. They know the answers because they know what I'll say. So, and I felt that way about my parents, and maybe you feel that about your parents. At some point, you get to a point where. Brain is just pretty much working pretty well. Uh, that's depressing. Um, so I just want to point out one other uh, quick issue that's kind of interesting. If you look at cells that you haven't looked at before, like microglia, this is a microglial cell in uh, rodent brain. We found that the microglia have processes that are attracted to philopodia, not dendritic spines, but philopodia of neurons. This is not sort of textbook knowledge. It's just it emerges from looking at these microglia. That this microglia, all these yellow things, are dendritic philopodia of neurons that have little processes stuck out that touch the tips of microglia. And you know, here's two philopodia of two different neurons that are touching a microglia process. So there are lots of sort of bottom-up weird things that we didn't know about before. Uh, and here's one that's really interesting. Here's a neuron, a pyramidal neuron. Uh, the, the nucleus of the neuron is folded on one side where most of the processes are coming out and smooth on the other side. That's why we studied this cell. But that wasn't the thing that was really interesting. Uh, if I go back here. The thing that was really interesting is a capillary was running right through the apical dendrite of this cell. I was like, what? <laughs> but that is true. I mean, this is not a theory. This is a fact. And how that happened, I have no idea. So in the remaining 15 minutes, I want to just show you a, a, an attempt to analyze a circuit. Now, you're going to hear from Murray, I think, a lot about Thalmus. So I'm not going to talk much about this except what, what we saw in the general science. Yeah. Yes, it's the only one we ever saw. But I don't know whether that makes it an outlier or a very important thing that happens once in a, a million. Yeah, I don't know. It is an outlier, definitely an outlier. Uh, we thought the simplest place in the brain to see a wiring diagram uh, would be in the thalamus, where you go from retina and there are retinal ganglion cell types, as I've already mentioned, that make different style synapses on thalamocortical cells, thalamic cells that send their axons to the cortex. And I, this is an oversimplification, but in general, one thinks that there are kind of pathways of information flowing from the retina to the cortex uh, related to different types of retinal ganglion cells. They have different types of synapses. They innervate thalamocortical cells that have different shapes in the mouse, bipolar or stellate. And we wanted to do this, do it quickly, and then go back in development and see how pruning uh, played a role in this. That was our goal. Uh, uh, this is what we found, which was something, it looks more messy. Uh, and the first thing was that um, different kinds of retinal cells as 
demonstrated by the fact that they have consistently different shaped types of synapses, innervated the same thalamocortical cell. So we had a kind of mixing of types on thalamocortical cells. We also had that the same type of retinal cell, individual retinal cells, so it's the same axon even, would innervate different type of cortical cell, uh, of thalamocortical cells. Like one axon would innervate both bipolar and stellate cells. We also found uh, that retinal cells from different kinds, that the same retinal axon, if you trace it out, will form one kind of synapse on some kind of thalamocortical cells and consistently form another kind of synapse on another kind of thalamocortical cell. So this is saying that the axons do different things on different targets, and this is saying um, the same axon innervates different targets uh, with the same kind of axon. So there's something, everything is different and complicated here. And finally, we could not predict anything about the connectivity in the mouse basically by just looking at the shape of the target cells. It was not predictive about who would innervate these cells by just looking at their shape. And this is sort of a Kahalian notion that if you see the shape of a cell, you can anticipate what type of cell it is. In this piece of retina, in this piece of thalamus at least, we couldn't do that. I'll just show you how this is done. We took a 100 terabyte data set, and right in the middle we found four thalamocortical cells that were right next to each other. And we liked these cells because in reconstructing them in the electron micrograph, a microscope, some of them were bipolar and some of them were stellate. So we said, okay, we've got several types that are right next to each other, and then we're going to reconstruct them. And the way we did this, just show you how connectomics analysis goes, is we take one of those cells, reconstruct its dendrites, and then find all the synapses from the retina onto these dendrites by looking for synapses that have light mitochondria where we can trace the axons out into the optic uh, nerve coming in to the, the optic, not nerve, the optic tract. No, the yeah, optic tract. Anyway, we find all those axons that make those synapses onto these dendrites, then trace those axons back, and find all the other synapses they make in the thalamus. And then for each of those axons, we trace those synapses forward to find all the other thalamocortical cells innervated by these same axons. And in this way, we get the cohort of thalamocortical cells that share innervation with that cell in white. And we did that for each of those four cells that were right next to each other. So that was the, that's basically the process. You make that as the seed cell, and reconstruct back, and then reconstruct forward. And the, the, the corticofugal. Uh, We're doing that right now. But because the reason I ask is because these seem to be spread out on all, all the dendrites. They, no, these are proximal dendrites. The yeah. distal tips oh, see, so are not innervated. Okay. Yeah, these are all proximal. So you end up, if you just draw this out, uh, with a big mess. Um, so you have to do something, even as biologists we know, you can't just look at this and make any sense out of it. So we did a network, uh, and, and this is just a spring force network. Some of you probably understand networks like this. It's not a spatial network. It just says, for each of the seed cells, these big circles, what are all the, uh, thalamic, uh, the, all the retinal axons that innervate these cells? Those are these little triangles. And then what are all the other thalamocortical cells that share innervation from those same triangles? So all these red circles are thalamocortical cells that share input with this seed cell. And these are uh, thalamocortical cells that share retinal input with this seed cell, and so on. And you can see the fact that this is all interconnected is that there isn't uh, absolutely ambiguously, uh, unambiguous pathways for each of these cells. They are all interconnected. And um, this is dominated, unfortunately, by the seed cells. So we have to sort of get the seed cells out of the spring force model. The springs are strongest when there are a lot of synapses shared and weakest when there are very few synapses shared. And since all the seed cells, we got all the synapses, there's a lot on there. So we get, we just don't give the springs any force for the seed cells, so they're out here. And then we're left with a network that is more sort of objective. 
Um, and again, it's still highly interconnected. And to, I'm making a very long story very short here, but to make sense out of this, we said maybe the weakest connections are least important. Maybe there is some organization, but let's not throw, uh, let's not focus on these weak connections. What about the strong connections? So one way to do that is to take this spring force model, seed cells are out, and then prune away the weakest connections to break this into smaller cohorts. And I'm doing that process for you now. And I'm going to stop it arbitrarily at this point. And I'm just putting arbitrary colors around these groups that all are related to thalamocortical cells that share input with the first seed cell I showed you. These are the green ones. That first white cell was this cell. And so this is a bunch of thalamocortical cells that are still tightly interconnected, but somehow separated from these thalamocortical cells and these and these and these. And each have a different set of retinal ganglion cells that they're associated with. So this single seed cell seems to be a bunch of smaller groups, even though everything is very large and interconnected in space, for some reason, uh, that seed cell has a, a set of thalamocortical cells and retinal ganglion cells that are closely associated with each other and separable from these other sets. And I, the reason I colored these is to show you that if you look at where these synapses are located on the seed cell, they're each located in a different region of the seed cell. Even though these axons are growing everywhere, the five groups of retinal ganglion cells associated with the green seed cell each innervate a different region of the seed cell, dendritic arbor, implying that there's some kind of interdendritic, as opposed to neuron doctrine, organization of networks in the thalamus. It's a very weird thing. I mean, I wouldn't have expected this, but this region of this dendritic tree is associated with all these thalamocortical cells, these retinal ganglion cell axons innervate this and also innervate all these circles here. And that's distinct from the ones that uh, are associated with this part of the dendritic tree. What is this? This dendritic organization is not at the level of neurons now. It's at a, a smaller level. So we ask the question, how is it possible that all the axons that innervate this region also, let's say, innervate this cell? a different thalamocortical cell that shares exactly the same axons as this region here. All these axons innervate this region and also innervate that cell. So we reconstructed uh, with connectomics. You can reconstruct anything. So we reconstructed and discovered that the axons that were on that dendrite <laughs> are fasciculated as a group, and they hop from one dendrite to another dendrite of another thalamocortical cell neuron. Now, this kind of dendritic hopping of a whole bunch of axons has not been seen before because you can't see it with any other technique. If you label all the axons, there's just axons everywhere. If you label one axon, sure, you'll see an axon jump from one dendrite to another, but you won't make much of it. But if you label all the axons on one dendrite and you find that all of them en masse go over to another dendrite, you can only do that with connectomics. And not only is the excitatory input doing that, but the inhibitory, there's an inhibitory axon that is also hopping from one to the other. Question. Yes? The origin of these axons that are hopping together, <coughs> you, you, you wouldn't know or you would know whether they're topographically adjacent in the retina. I do not know. I, I'm assuming that these cells have a receptive field property related to the topography, the retinotopy in the thalamus. So I'm assuming they're from the same part. And I'm assuming uh, that they may be different functions that are dendritically isolated to different places. And because there's inhibition, you could turn on and turn off a channel onto this cell with the inhibition, perhaps. Yes? When you talk about strength of connection, are you talking about in this case, we're only looking at number of synapses, which turns out, both in the cortex and in the thalamus, 
to be a dynamic, interesting metric. It may be that there are changes in the efficacy of si single synapses, but there's no doubt that there is some kind of strength associated with how many synapses you make. And that's not surprising, but that clearly is taking advantage. So, Do you have to wait from looking at the physiology of how strong a synapse actually is from the way it looks? I don't. I mean, I can imagine. I mean, many of these axons make so many synapses, they may drive the cell to threshold from the thalamus, from the retina. Because some of the synapses look like they're just touching at a tiny point. Right. right. Some of them make one synapse, and then they make a second, and a third, and a fourth to glom on to these proximal dendrites. They're close to the cell body, so they're probably pretty powerful. Yeah. Um, regarding the axons that are hopping together, do you yeah. know which there's no path there. I mean, this is the whole thalamus is like this. It's just filled with these fascicles. You see it in the cortex. A bunch of axons are running together. You, never, you just think, oh, they're running next to each other. But in the thalamus, at least, many of them are not only running together, but they are innervating the same target cells. And the, because the inhibition, I'm just going to end with this, because the inhibition is doing that as well, uh, Josh and I began looking at these local inhibitory interneurons, which are gigantic cells. Uh, here's one of them. And what Josh did was find every single synapse made onto and out and coming off of this local inhibitory neuron. And this is a picture that uh, doesn't do justice to what the data is here. But this neuron basically has bifunctional axon dendrite processes everywhere. Murray Sherman, I think, is, I think you've said this for a long time. Um, and this is definitely the case for a cell like this. Every single process is both uh, receiving inhibitory synapses from the retina, 713 synapses. And, uh, sorry, the green ones are the retinal synapses on. And at every red place is a synapse the cell is making. Uh, so the cell is making and receiving synapses on virtually all of its processes. It doesn't seem like a cell that's collecting information and sending out an axon. Uh, and that's demonstrated by the fact that when you look at how they're related to the thalamocortical cells, any dendrite that gets at within any localization to this cell gets innervated uh, by this inhibitory neuron. It's all local interactions. And it participates in that entire network I showed you about before. It had no selectivity there. And in addition, it had thousands of other neurons that it innervated. And to make matters even worse, every synaptic motif I know about with inhibition, direct inhibition, feed uh, reciprocal inhibition, feed forward inhibition, feed forward disinhibition, some weird kind of thing. I don't even know what to call this. <coughs> this cell does it all. And this is um, you know, a challenge, I think, going forward. So I just end with this one last point. Um, there is a great complexity problem coming at us. I keep saying understanding is a problem. And I'll tell you, this is so rare uh, for me to feel that the paradigm is shifting under my feet, and I'm not really sure what to do about it. When I was young, we had lots of good theories, a lot of understanding or pseudo understanding. At least it felt like understanding. And the only thing that never got in the way was data. We didn't have any information. And now what's happening? as you can imagine, is the information is getting very heavy. And the biggest casualty of this big data may be these big ideas. And this is the challenge, I think, for the future and for computer scientists, is how to somehow leverage this information for something. I don't know whether it will be the word understanding, whether it will be models that are predictive that no one understands, but at least are in silico models of the way the brain works. I'm not sure what it is, but this is the challenge going forward. And uh, it's your problem, not mine. So thank you very much. Just. Presented, uh, you know, these huge data files, and then you would analyze like four neurons of yeah. connection. So in a sense, you've got this five million dollar machine that slices things up and takes it. But don't you have enough data to, like, if you didn't cut another brain, couldn't you do analysis for a very, very long time? At the right, we're going. Absolutely. But I think the hope is to take this out of the hands of people like me. 
to use automatic segmentation, you'll hear about that later today, and then do all this analysis at a much bigger scale to really see what's there rather than what humans can pick out in these trivially small data sets. I see that. I, I don't like it, but it's the truth. Yeah, it's a good point. Um, so you've shown examples where you uh, sort of by these techniques figured sort of new patterns of connectivity, th these kinds of things. So that's one kind of insight that you can get from this data. Um, from the first part of your talk, I, I somehow <coughs> imagined you would ideally like to uh, uh, sort of uh, scan a whole brain and give that data to somebody. Uh, so w what would you ha hope to learn from such a whole brain uh, thing? I mean, I, I relate to the comment on the convolutional neural networks. Well, we know everything, but still uh, it's not of much use to now go through the synapses of this network and, and try to learn how it is doing things. Still, we have an understanding how a convolutional network works, right? but not on the level of the detailed connectivity. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm of the opinion uh, that more information is better than less, even though in my instinct here is that the biggest impediment to understanding is actually getting more information. The more information we have, the harder, not the easier. It's, people say to me, no, yeah, you're right, we don't understand today, but in 50 years we'll understand. I say, no, it's going to be even worse. It's not getting better. It's going to get more and more and more and more and more. It's not, it, it, unless you're hoping that somehow out of all this will crystallize some simple idea, it's very unlikely because biology is, was not designed to be understood. It was just designed to work. And, and this is a real problem. It's a very different with understanding things humans make that were based on ideas. This isn't based on ideas. It's based on accidents of, of evolution. So what do we do? I mean, it's like, what does the Hubble telescope's value? It looks out in space and sees all these weird things. And we try to build theories based on what it sees. You could say, well, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make a theory based on all that, so it should, we should stop looking. It's, I think it's sort of antithetical to the human notion of exploration. You explore, and you see things you didn't see before, and then you have to deal with it. And maybe dealing with this kind of data is different from dealing with other kinds of data. I don't know. That's my, my view about this. Is there a chance of a Watson Crick moment here? Where... Yeah, I mean, remember, the Watson and Crick moment was going down that U. That was going down. It was reducing. This is going up, and, and when you go up in genomics is a good example, you end up with a massive amount of very interesting genomic data, for example, in genomics, and it's not that people say someday we'll understand it. It's, it's a little posed question to say, can I understand the genome? You can understand every little bit of it, and, and it's a bunch of little special things, uh, 20,000 genes that work in time and space to generate all the phenotypes in an animal through biochemistry and three-dimensional structures. There's nothing general. There's just data. And, and genomics is a field that is no longer trying to come up with a Watson and Crick moment. It's trying to leverage that information to get insight into what kinds of genes are important for disease and Evo Devo questions. Yeah. But if we're if we're going up the, the branch of the U, that implies that we've already had the Watson Crick moment, that we have enough reductive knowledge to build something out of. Is that to be assumed? Well, I mean, you may not remember, but I put a big question mark from from the law of dynamic polarization mm -hmm. that uh, Cajal had to connect tomics. I would say when we see dendrites being independent entities, when we see glial cells associated in odd ways, when we see so much connectivity that is not predicted by Cajal, then in fact you are, you're in a world where you're both learning new things and building a data set. And I don't know which of those two is more important or whether both will happen. But that happened in genomics as well. Imprinting, which is fundamental, was not part of the way down. It was on the way back up. And it, it is changing the way a lot of people think about phenotype. Um, can you comment about uh, the difference between your technique and clarity? <coughs> I mean, how does clarity... So clarity... No, no, no. Yeah. I mean, clarity and all the other clearing techniques. And clarity is a clearing technique, of which there are many. Uh, 
a guy named Doug Richardson and I wrote a review in Cell of all the imaging clearing techniques. They're all for optical imaging, so they're limited by diffraction. And diffraction is limited by the numerical aperture of the lens. So you're talking about lateral resolutions of a micron or half a micron at best and Z resolution of three quarters of a micron or worse. So compared to these nanometer things, you can't see any of this. Jeff, I, um, I wonder if you're being a little bit pessimistic about yes. progress. Hello. Just for fun, good to see you again. Um, what you're seeing with, with Josh's work on the clustering of dendritic innervation you know, is a seed of a rule for viral. <coughs> and there's many different studies, both connectomic and um, uh, Thomas Ortner's work. Mm -hmm. and we could list 20 more where the seeds of the rules of wiring are uh, emerging. And if you have the rules of wiring, then you can simulate wiring. And then you can compare the simulation to the structures. Yeah. So, I mean, just, we're just at the very first footsteps of this long program. But you know, it seems like there's you know, an optimistic uh, uh, interpretation instead of question. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I guess the way we put it is, let's do as much brain as we need to do until it gets boring. That is, that we're not going to see anything we haven't seen before. I mean, it, the wiring may differ, but not it, it, only in ways that our models would predict it would differ. That we, we're not seeing any new phenomena. And is a cubic millimeter enough, or do you have to do a whole mouse brain, or do you have to do a brain of many different species to see that wide group of ideas? But maybe a very small amount of brain is enough, and then one doesn't have to do a whole brain. And, that, and then, because everything else is predictable based on what you've already seen. We are certainly not there yet. I mean, maybe there's a thousand more rules to see. I think we'd be ordin extraordinarily lucky if the very first time we look at a thalamus, we see the one rule that was missing. <laughs> it's very unlikely. Very interesting that you mentioned genomics and connectomics <coughs> at the top of your beautiful view, uh, conception of the history of science. But, uh, I was wondering if it's even scarier that we have to understand both. In other words, are there, uh, are there uh, do you suspect that there are molecular uh, enzymatic uh, things going on that uh, are the masters of this, of the world wide? So, you know, that, uh, you know, I mean, my view is that there are many single-celled organisms that have behaviors as sophisticated as those that have central nervous systems. Um, protozoa, if you watch them behave in their natural environment, they're single cells, they don't have a nervous system. They have a massively complicated behavioral repertoire. They have sex, they avoid things, they're attracted to things, they do all sorts of things, and they do it all by biochemistry. There's no wires, no nothing. So from that perspective, there is a rich, mysterious way in which molecules generate behavior. And, and if that were sufficient, we would just be one gigantic cell. But because of diffusion limitations, we have to funnel those signals into long little pathways. And so our dendrites are, in a sense, uh, surrogates for molecular pathways, perhaps. That would be my way of thinking about that. So Jeff, one question is, um, yeah, it's, it seems pretty um, kind of um, <coughs> challenging what, what you described to us to understand this. And I wonder if we actually take together, I mean, if we do what people start now to call functional connectomics. So that rather than just looking at the structure, we really try to to kind of gather data sets where we have not only the structure, but where we also, because I mean, somehow this makes, you know, if you just look at the structure, it makes the assumption, well, every neuron does its own thing and has to, uh, and we have to understand the communication with all these other cells, and it's ex extremely complicated. But maybe if we do both things together, there might be actually some, some cuts to this, to this body and not somehow. Yeah. That's I think a lot of people think that is true. Um, my view is that most of the activity data is sampled over uh, matters of hours. 
which is almost certainly a very, very, very small subset of the behavioral repertoire at the activity level of the area you're looking at. So if you overemphasize what you're seeing there, 99.9% .9 of the synapses are just irrelevant. And, and so I'm not sure that's the right answer either. It, it couldn't hurt. It's more information. It's something to look at, but it's maybe not sufficient. I think of the wiring diagram as having the entire <laughs> repertoire of what could happen is right before you. And it must constrain your models some way to know what that repertoire is. But um, yeah. Plants are uh, devoid of this complexity. Plants? Plants. Yeah. And yet their genomes are as large as animals. That's right. So what's going on? Well, you know, a worm's genome is about the size of our genome, and they only have 300 neurons. So I, I think with humans, what's going on is you have a very, very large brain with a duplication of cells, huge duplications. Every cell type is reiterated millions and millions of times. And then you're doing something with those cells to parse out the world's information into a form that you can use it for behavior. Yeah, but the differentiation, cell differentiation information has to be in the genome, shouldn't it? But not learning. But not learning. Yeah, but the differentiation is hugely complex here, as you yeah, said. Yeah, but I, I, th I think this is a red herring, in my view. I think it's a red herring. I think for the retina, it's not a red herring. Because you're trying to make a filter that doesn't require learning in order to extract information from the world. But the ability to read, that's not, that, that's not from your genes. <laughs> it's from your experience and the language you speak. The tennis game you play or whatever. You know, that's all in your, in your learning. And that's what most of your brain is made up of. If you think about what you do most of the day. I don't think you play tennis all day, but you know, you, you are using your brain for things related to thinking with a language which you didn't have when you were born. Yeah, but there's in an enormously complex hardware to make all, you know, the tennis happen, the reading happen, and so on and so forth, which plants do not have. Yeah. It's saying that the algorithm for learning is not in plants. They don't need to learn in order to survive. Although they, better, they may have to learn how to read soon because we are doing our best to kill them off. I think we've probably... Thank you. Let's thank Jeff one more time.